Good afternoon. I'm welcome today to another Q and A in conversation with um, a local person who's going to talk to us about courtals. Um, my name is Claire Willits. I'm the Collections and Exhibitions Curator at Braintree Museum, and I'm joined here this afternoon with John Miners, who has lots of different hats. Um, one of which is a retired textile consultant. Um, he's also director of the Warner Archive Trading Textile Trading Company. He's a museum trustee for us, um, and he's also chairman of Housestead Local History Society. Um, and we're just going to talk a little bit about the importance of Courtauld's in Housestead and also John's um, experience of working for the company in the 60s. Um, so to kick off, John, first question was, what was it like um, when you were living near the mill as a child? Well, we, we, we didn't actually live in the mill, we lived opposite the mill, but anyway, there we go, that's another story. Um, how we came to live there was that um, mum and dad moved out from London in the early 50s, uh, mainly because they couldn't find anywhere to live uh, up in town. And they started coming out for weekends and stayed in the cottages that belonged to an acquaintance of theirs. And in the end, they moved out um, and um, they were living um, over towards Bewers. And within a few weeks, dad got a job at Courtauld's in Halstead. And for the first 18 months, he used to cycle in um, to, well, he used to cycle part of the way and then get on a bus. And then eventually um, we were, he was offered a, uh, one of the houses that are opposite the, the factory. And you can see them here. This is this row of houses, this is factory terrace. These were built in 1872 by the company um, and were more or less sort of like lodging houses. They were, um, there was always, a, there was always sort of house parents, if you like. And it was where the girls from the outlying villages would stay during the week whilst they were working at the mill. So we moved into number seven, which is that one there, number seven. And um, we moved in there in about January, uh, 1955. And it was quite luxurious for my parents because we'd come from a cottage uh, in between Earl's Cone and Bewers, which had no main water, no main electricity. And here they had electricity on the ground floor. There was no electricity on the first and second floors. And they did have an inside toilet and bathroom as well. So we grew up there. Um, and so um, I really, as a, as a child and a teenager, I lived with the sound of the factory running um, for 24 hours a day, five days a week. And even now I can recollect um, waking up, well, coming to, let's say, um, on a Monday between about 10 to six and six o'clock, and you could hear the machinery all starting and within minutes, all the looms were running and uh, it all was noise. And, and that kept going because they ran three shifts, six to two, two to 10 and 10 to six, um, five days a week, as I said, 6 a.m. on a Monday through to 6 a.m. on a Saturday morning. And so we were, um, we were, we were um, exposed to it all the time. And in the end, you took no notice of the noise whatsoever. Um, and in fact, you, you noticed it more when the, um, when the machinery wasn't running. And I can remember one day when um, I was at the secondary school, which was at the end of the road, so I didn't even know far to go to school, you see. Walked down the road to that. Um, and we came out at, at break time. And um, I was aware that there was something wrong. And, and it was because there'd been a power cut and none of the machinery was running, which was unusual at that time of day. So, yeah, so it, there was no sort of nasty smells or anything like that. It was just the general noise of the, of the looms running. And there, there were a lot of looms. If I just go back to that first image again, this, um, this section here, this was what was known as the big shed. And that was completed in 1922. That was the last extension on the Halstead site. And that had 625 shuttle looms in it. And uh, that was really, really noisy. Um, and um, obviously you, you, you were aware of that all the time. And then the other, the other parts of the factory weren't quite as noisy as that. But that's what the experience was like. And for those that don't know Halstead, um, we, the fact they, those houses are still standing, aren't they? They are, yeah. Yeah, so you can see. And which parts are now um, of the factory are still, the factory building is still standing from that aerial view? Well, what's still standing is there's the original um, corn mill, 
across the river here, which is the white weatherboarded mill, um, which is an antique center. Um, that was originally built in 1780, and that was converted to a silk throwing mill by Samuel Courtauld um, in 1825. So that survives. This facade of this building survives. This building survives. Um, this little building, these buildings here survive. And the, you can't see it very well here, but there's the, um, uh, the surgery and the gatehouse over here and they survive, but nothing else is left other than factory terrace. And this building here actually, which is the um, powerhouse the, um, from again, 1922, and that survives. And that is scheduled to be turned into um, apartments at some point, but we don't know when. It's such a great photo. You really get the scale of it, don't you? Yeah, it yeah this, this, this was taken in May, 1968. Um, and it's the photo I use for the final slide when I do my talks and I make everybody laugh because I say if you look very very carefully you can see me and my brother playing football on the glass up here but <laughs> it's another story. But, uh, so your parents were pleased to move into that house? They were, they were very pleased to move into the house and uh, we, we, we lived there till 1968 um, and so it was it was my formative years really and uh, it had four bedrooms because obviously it's got two floors so there's two bedrooms on the top floor, two bedrooms on the middle floor, and then a front room and a back room and a kitchen out the back on the ground floor. Um, and then there was the bathroom and the toilet beyond the kitchen. No central heating at that time, obviously. Um, and I can remember waking up in the winter to frost on the inside of the windows. Uh, this, was, this was the room that my brother and I shared. And then later on, probably from about the age of 13, I was able to have this top room um, and uh, each room had a fireplace. And, and so in the winter, as I was older and more sensible, I was, I, I was allowed to have a coal fire in my bedroom, which I must say was needed because they were freezing. <laughs> but they are lovely houses, although I must admit, I wouldn't want to live there now because um, the, this, this is all um, the, the co-op the co co car park covers this area now. Um, so it's not quite the same as it was. No, not got quite the same atmosphere. No, not at all. So then you went as a teenager, didn't you, to work for Courtauld? So I what, did. You did. So you can you tell us a bit about how you started working for Courtauld? I mean, it probably well, is an obvious profession. Well, yeah. Well, I that wasn't my original plan. My original plan was I was going to go on to college, do A levels, then go on to teacher training college and become a teacher. But um, in the last few weeks before O levels, apparently. I announced one day that I didn't want to do that anymore. I was going to go to work. And so my dad told me in no uncertain terms that I'd better sort myself something out, uh, some sort of training scheme or apprenticeship. And looking around, obviously at that time, um, in Braintree, there was Crittles and Lake and Elliot's and Bradbury's. Um, and in Halstead, we had uh, obviously Courtaulds. There was also another company called Portways who were founders who made the cast iron cylindrical tortoise stoves and another company that went it's an electronics company that went by the wonderful name of Evans Electro Selenium um, and they made medical instruments um, and of course there was Courtaulds and I must admit that the um, major reason for my trying to get a job at Courtaulds and succeeding was because um, we where we lived and my thinking as a 16 year old was that if I get a job there I can stay in bed until the last possible minute and um, just tip, tumble out of bed, get dressed and go to work. And of course, needless to say, uh, it's a well-known fact that the closer that you live to where you work, uh, you're always late. And I was, I was late every day, uh, the time I worked there until we moved. And then once we moved, I used to be early every day because you allowed too much time to get there. But, uh, but that was the main reason for doing it. And um, I did, um, I, was, I, I was taken on as what they called a general apprentice. and. Uh, that really, uh, the, the title explains it all. You were an apprentice um, and you worked in all the different departments in the three local mills. So that was Halstead, Braintree and Bocking. And, and you did a bit of everything. Um, and I rapidly discovered that um, I was pretty useless at most things practical, something which my wife will agree with even today. 
Um, and so, uh, but that's what I did. Um, so I started off in, uh, um, well, I finished school, we had a fortnight's holiday and then I started work. And the first department I went into was this one, which was the pern winding or spooling department. And um, a spool is, um, I can show you one, hang on. That's such a fantastic photograph. So this is the, um, this is the container that uh, the, 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 the weft yarn, the weft goes from left to right across the fabric. So the spooling department was, the, the, the job there was to wind the yarn onto these and then they go in the shuttle which goes from side to side across the loop. So there I was two weeks out of school as a spotty, very, very shy 16 year old suddenly thrust into this department with um, me as the one male, a foreman, an engineer and the rest were all women. Um, and it was pretty scary, I will admit that. But um, but no, that, so that's where I spent the first two and a half months, I suppose, and it was as boring as anything. <laughs> it, was, it was awful. I hated every minute of it, really. And I thought, what on earth am I doing? What on earth have I come to do this for? But then I was sent off to Braintree College to do a, a six week, the first block of six weeks at Braintree College. Uh, which was which was full time, so that wasn't so bad. And then then I came back and I was moved into a different department, um, and um, and so I went on really from from there. So how um, long were you? In, you this was the mid sixties when you joined. My this right? was six, 1967 I I started here, and and the apprenticeship lasted for three years. So I I spent from August sixty seven through to about. Um, September, October 68 there. And then I was moved to Braintree Weaving Mill. And then I stayed there through to May of 69. And I was moved to Bocking, which was where the, uh, the dye house um, and company headquarters was. Um, so Halstead really was the weaving part of the business. Braintree was yarn processing and there was a small weaving shed there. And then Bocking was the dye house and the um, admin accounts and all those sorts of things but that was just the Essex mills don't forget that there were there was another mill in Norfolk in Norwich and there was a mill at Lee in Lancashire and another one at Nelson in Lancashire and that's what comprised the Samuel Courtauld um, division of the Courtaulds group because obviously the Courtaulds group was a massive multinational encompassing lots of different industries from paints to chemicals to uh, chickens <laughs> so then how long were you at Courtauld altogether? So I know you didn't I, stay there for all. I stayed there till 1980. So I did um, I did my time at um, Halstead and uh, this is a sh this is an interior shot of uh, what we call the big shed. So it gives you an idea of just how many of those looms were there. Um, and they were, as I say, the noise was just amazing. All the um, older weavers who, who had been working there for a long while, they could all lip read and uh, they would hold conversations across their sets of looms. Um, but uh, if you didn't, you literally had to shout into the other person's ears and you came out uh, after a, you know, an eight hour shift and uh, your ears were ringing like you'd been to a heavy metal concert, basically. So, uh, so there, so that was, um, that was Bocking, uh, uh, sorry, Halstead. Um, and then at, at Braintree, that's a shot of the Braintree weaving shed. And uh, this is this is a bit later. This these water jet looms were acquired by the company for Braintree and for Halstead. Um, in in and again, so I think the deal was done in 66, 67. And there is um, there is a theory that uh, uh, they came from the Czech from Czechoslovakia. Um, and at the time, of course, the, it was the Labour government with Harold Wilson, and uh, there was a sort of a an urban myth that uh, these were acquired as a, as a sort of a thank you for the Russians buying Courtauld yarn manufacturing equipment, but whether that's true or not, I don't know. The, the interesting thing about the water jet looms is that uh, they were designed really to weave um, things like cotton and wool. Um, and when the Czech fitters came to, uh, to help set them up, they, they were horrified that uh, Samuel Courtauld was going to try weaving nylon and uh, acetate yarns which are perfectly smooth and they 
they were they were amazed that they actually did their job because basically with a water jet loom there's a fine jet of water that takes the weft across the across the width of the uh, of the loom um, but of course it meant that everything was very very damp and all the fabric had to be dried then once it was woven so that uh, um, that that uh, that was that was the way it did so they had to get a, a drying machine in as well as the usual things so Braintree and then at Bocking as I said before they that was where the uh, the dyeing and finishing was done and that's a just a general shot of the of the dye house that was smelly that wasn't a pleasant place to work I must admit um, and I, I um, you, you, it, the, the health and safety at the time was not quite what it was today I can well remember that um, one of the one of the chemicals that was used in in in, in these dyeing vats was caustic soda um, and when the men who were working on these needed caustic soda for their for their dye vat they would take a bucket and they would walk up the uh, up the room to uh, a great big uh, vat of uh, a great big barrel of um, caustic soda they would fill their bucket and they would walk back through with an open bucket of caustic soda um, so highly dangerous highly dangerous but so I did various things and um, it, it, it was interesting, let's put it that way, but um, I, the, the area I joined, I enjoyed best of all was the, uh, the design department, but uh, I was told in no uncertain terms that I couldn't go in that because I hadn't got a degree and you needed a degree to work in the design department. So when I refused to do what they, you would normally do after, uh, after, um, after your apprenticeship, they really didn't know what to do with me particularly. So uh, the normal route was that you became a, what they called a loom overlooker, which was um, a mechanic that looked after the looms in the weaving sheds, but they needed to know about um, the qualities of yarns and how yarns would uh, um, work with the different machinery. Um, and I didn't want to do that. So uh, they put me in the dye house for a while and then I was moved back to Braintree Weaving as, a, as an assistant work study officer, um, which generally was just sort of compiling statistics um, and then I was moved back to Bocking to do a sales admin job and then moved into quality control and and that that I really did enjoy because um, with quality control you had to try you were you were allowed to have a, a pool car and you had to go off to the other mills in the north or go off on complaints and things like that and all of a sudden you weren't in the confines of four walls anymore and you, you could sort of not do what you wanted but you were you were a lot freer to uh, to do things it was it was not the easiest of things to do because if a if a garment manufacturer got a whole load of fabric which was faulty and uh, it was holding up their production you were not the most popular person when you had to go and make sure that uh, it was as faulty as they said it was so really varied I mean, over 13 years lots of very different it was, yeah 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 and i ended up i ended up in a sales role so i ended up um um doing a what they call loom state sales which is the fabric before it's dyed and uh i was i used to travel and again it was it was quite a nice job because i'd spend two or three days a week in bocking in the office and then two or three days for two or three days a week going up to london and i would visit various um textile merchants and, and what they call textile converters and a converter was uh, a company who would buy the loom state fabric or the grey fabric it's sometimes called from the weaving mill have it shipped to a dyer or a printer and then have it shipped from the printer to the um, to their, their the final customer the garment maker um, and I can remember one or two I used to see they just had a desk in a room they never ever saw any of the fabric and it was just done and because it was um, loom state fabric it, it wasn't a case of carrying around samples you were selling the construction and a lot of the time they knew what they wanted and you were going in to negotiate uh, um, negotiate the latest order basically and you'd be arguing over 0.1 of a penny because we're talking about fabrics that were costing between 20 and 30 pence a meter because it was very very basic um, lining cloths in the main. Mm. Well it, sounds, it does sound very interesting it was it was a good background and it meant that i got a good technical grounding although i couldn't do it i could talk about it and i understood it that was the main thing yes and that's often the key isn't it yeah how um i know house did in particular is, is quite 
close to your sort of heart. How do you think, how important do you think the mill was to the town? Oh, it was, it was the major employer in the town. I mean, and, and had been for a long, long while. I mean, when you think that um, in um, 1841, it was employing 1500 people. And then by 1860, there was two and a half thousand people employed there. It was a, it was the town's major employer. Well, as the company was in, in Braintree and Bocking as well. Um, so everyone who grew up in the town had a member of the family who worked there. And amongst those sort of um, families, it was, it was given really that when you left school, you'd go and work at the factory or go and work at the mill. You know, I was just about to ask you that. How, how many people that you went to school with, for example, would think that was the place I was going to go and work when they left school in the 50s? Well, uh, in my class, I was the only one who went there, actually, um, which was yeah. bizarre. But, um, but no, it was, um, it, yeah, I would say probably 10% of every year would, would end up working at, uh, at Courtaulds. Or they might go to Courtaulds at Braintree or Bocking, you know, but it was because they used to run a bus from one mill, one site to the other sometimes as well. Uh, but uh, but no, it was, a, as I say, they, they were the major employer in the town. And such a big physical presence as well in the centre of the town. Oh, from absolutely. A, I mean, you must have I been mean, able to hear the noise from quite a, a, a distance away. As yeah, well. I mean, certainly in the town, I mean, in the town. Yeah, certainly the road um, that we lived out on this one, and then and then the school was sort of here to the right, so you could hear it in and around the school area, but it didn't travel much further than that. I must admit, um, they had quite a lot of soundproofing, and uh, um, they 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 built a big high fence along here, the school side of that, to uh, cut the noise down as much as possible. But uh, it, it was still a uh, it was it was a major presence and to be in the center of the town as well not like today where um, um, you know factories are uh, situated in out of town or on the outskirts of towns but you could argue the same for you know crittles in Braintree really you know they were they were on Coggeshall Road and, and they were on, on the edge of the residential area really or in the middle of the residential area yeah yeah they were sort of in between the town and residential areas when there is mm. Mm. Um, but then, and also, Halstead Mill was quite significant in the company's history, wasn't it? In terms of like the early 1900s, in terms of when they're, they're mm. moving towards um, Crayon. Can you talk, tell us a little bit about that? Well, what when um, when Samuel started the business back in 1816, of course, he had the small mill in Panfield Lane. Then they built Bounden Mill in South Street in Braintree. Then he acquired the lease for the mill at Bocking from the Savile family. And then, as I said before, he, he converts um, the, the corn mill here in 1825. Um, so in those, for probably from eight, the 1820s through to the 1880s, um, certainly at Halstead Mill and Braintree Mill, I'm not talking about Bocking now, um, they, they did some, uh, they, they did yarn wind, they did silk winding and they did weaving as well. Um, and then at uh, Bocking, that was where the dyeing took place. And there was the engineer's shop there where they built a lot of their own machinery. Um, but then when um, Mr. Tetley came into the business in the 1880s, he consolidated things. He, he could see that it was a bit silly having multiple um, production techniques taking place in each site. So he said, right, Bocking is gonna be for the dyeing and the finishing. Braintree is going to be for yarn processing, Halstead is going to be weaving. So Halstead then became the prime weaving mill in, within the Samuel Courtauld company. And when um, Courtaulds um, bought the patents for the production of viscose um, or rayon in the early 1900s, and they set the factory up in Coventry, the first yarn that was actually woven was woven here at Halstead Mill. Um, and uh, so it was, it was the testing ground for um, viscose, UK produced viscose yarn by the Courtaulds. Um, and, uh, and, 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 it was, and it went on from strength to strength because of that. So yes, hugely significant really then, I think is the answer to that question. It is, yeah. It was where, where those early viscose yarns were tested to see if um, you know, they were 
weavable or not. And that's why Courtauld's, um, you could argue, were much more successful than the other chemical companies within the UK who were attempting to produce viscose fibre because they had, um, they had this weaving facility within the company where they could produce a batch of yarn, send it down to Halstead, they could test it, and um, they, they could say, well, it needs, you know, it's, it's, it's wrong because of this. And then the scientists up at Coventry could then tweak the process and, and they could get it right. So it meant that when they did get it right and they were ready to start selling viscose yarn to um, outside manufacturers, they could say, well, look, these are some of the fabrics we've made with this fibre. It does work, you know, it, 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 we've proven it. So in a sense, they could do the whole process, I guess. Mm, but, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they were, yeah, you could argue they were a totally vertical operation right the way and, through. And the, 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 the success they'd had, obviously, with Victorian crepe had been enormous, but the success they saw in the 20th century with artificial silk was just beyond oh, that. Mind, mind blowing. The, the, the profits they, you, you see them making from sort of 1918 through to 1940 are eye watering. Every year the profits went up, and I'm talking millions, not just a few thousand. Um, and and the de even the depression in the early 30s didn't really affect the company at all uh, because they were just being so successful. And of course, it was also, I mean, it wasn't just the UK that was contributing towards those profits. They'd, they'd set up um, the first um, big viscose manufacturing plant in the US as well. So that's, uh, you know, that, that obviously contributed in a big way to the company profits. No, I'd, I'd not thought about that in terms of the depression. That's really interesting. Um, mm. Observation. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I've come to the end of my questions. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to share with us about Halstead and and your experience. Um, well, I did make a note of a few um, interesting figures here. You you mentioned the 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 black silk morning crepe a little while ago, and of course that's what um, the Courtauld company really became well known for. Um, they went into that. They basically they undercut everybody else because Samuel and his brother um, George worked out a way to mass produce it at about half the cost of anybody else. And uh, these figures just show how successful the production figures between 1830 and 1841, they manufactured 20, just over 29,000 yards of black silk morning crepe. Um, the following, the, the next decade, 1842 to 1851, that went up to 1.2 million yards and then the decade, the night, the 1850s, it was nearly 1.6 million yards of black silk morning crepe. It's it's a phenomenal amount of money uh, of, of textiles. It really is, and that's really what um, put them on the map. And the fact that they mass produced it, and that was the difference between Courtaulds, say, and Warners in Braintree, and Daniel Walters, or rather Warners and Daniel Walters in Braintree and Stephen Walters and, and the others in Silk Weavers in Sudbury, in that Samuel Courtauld embraced mass production, whereas the others really were much more small scale um, and um, kept fairly local, quite honestly. But of course, the irony is, of course, that Walters survives to this present day, um, whereas, of course, Courtaulds have long gone, Courtaulds. The final bit of Samuel Courtauld actually disappeared in um, 1989, when the, the last vestiges of the Samuel Courtauld Company, which by then was operating out of Not Nottinghamshire, and they, were, they weren't they were actually really manufacturing fabric, they were buying fabric in and dyeing it. Um, and that was sold to Torre Textiles, a, a Japanese fibre company. And um, But the interesting thing is that Torre Textiles does survive to the present day, and they've got a purpose-built factory in, um, in uh, where is it, Mansfield, in Nottinghamshire, where they're producing high-tech products for industrial use mainly. So um, yeah, so in some ways you could argue that Samuel Courtauld has survived to the present day, but not under the uh, under the name. And really, it, it, it's it not. It's Torre Textiles. Do you remember um, when the site in Halstead closed? I, I can't remember the last. Not one. really, no, because. Um, I'd left in 1980, I'd, they'd actually were offering voluntary redundancy and they'd started shutting mills up north and um, I was lucky enough, I, we decided that I'd take the voluntary redundancy because 
it uh, it represented just over a year's salary. Um, and then I was able to get, I got a job um, before I'd even finished. So I was very, really, really lucky. But because I was then working in London, really, I left, for, I left for work between half past six and seven most mornings and got home between half past seven and eight o'clock most nights. So what was happening within Essex with Courtaulds, I really was unaware of, quite honestly, which, well, other than the fact that my father uh, managed to get his 30 years in in 1982 and then was made redundant. Um, and he was one of the last ones to, to finish, having you know, dismantled looms and things like that. Um, but it was a great shock to the town. And, and you could argue the town's never really recovered from it. But of course, we're now talking, what, 40 years on. Yes, it's surprising, isn't it? That you suddenly realise it is 40 years ago. So that is mm. quite a chunk of, chunk of time. It is. Yeah. Yeah, I know when, when you, you had the exhibition at the museum and there was the bits in there in one of the display cabinets about the Braintree closures and um, the, the marches um, and, and things like that. I, I didn't remember any of that because I switched off from it. You know what it's like, you change jobs and you, 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 you don't really take any notice of what's going on at, at your old firm anymore, which is a hard thing to say, but um, that's a fact, I'm afraid. But your, but your dad, do you recall your dad being quite um, sad? Oh, or he was very bitter and twisted about it. <laughs> he blamed Margaret Thatcher for everything. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, he um, he was well. He it just sort of messed up the last five years of his uh, working life. Quite honestly, I mean, he was lucky enough that he was able to go back to his original trade um, after about eighteen months, and he finished up his working career as a, as a dental mechanic, making crowns and false teeth for people, which is what he did in London before he moved out here. But uh, no, he um, he was very. Uh, very bitter about it, if I'm honest. Um, and he put, the, he put the blame fair and squarely at the accountants um, because like a lot of um, large companies, not just here, but in Europe and in the US, um, accountants started running the businesses rather than people who understood what the business is about, um, which I seem to remember something that George Courtauld said when we interviewed him last year. And he said much the same. Um, that uh, accountants were all right whilst they're in the back office, but they shouldn't be allowed to run businesses. But we can't put the cat back in the bag because you know it's it, it, it's it, you can't you know you can't turn the clock back now. No, absolutely. Well, they are a fascinating company, and it's fascinating to hear how um, influential they were in the town. And just looking at that photograph again, I just think it's so amazing to see the scale. You always, when you look at these factory sites, including Crittles and the sites in Braintree and Bokken, when they have been demolished and you've not, I, I personally have never seen them in person. So it's always great to look at these aerial shots and see yeah. what a large scale they were. Yeah, um, it gives you, so, and, and we are lucky in Halston in that so much of the, well, not a lot, but, but probably 25, 20% 20 of the original buildings survive. But you know, the fact that we've still got this um, this building here, we've still got obviously the old mill and the mill house, the boiler house here, um, and this facade, but and, and, and the smaller buildings over here. And this is an interesting building because this was built by Samuel in the 1830s, 40s, and that was the first power, purpose built power weaving um, factory um, within within uh, Halstead basically and I can remember it was used as the engineers workshop and the if you remember a lot of the machine with well, the machinery was nearly all driven by overhead belts in 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 those early days originally by the um, obviously by the water wheel and then by steam engines and the overhead shafting as they call it the um the big wheels and things they survived in this in this building um, which is now part of Solar Supermarket. <laughs> well, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for um, joining Very welcome. me on this rainy February afternoon. Um, <laughs> Pretty... um, and thank you for your help and support with the project. No, that's all right. You're very welcome. Thanks, Claire. <laughs>